Today we are very excited to have a guest from America here, Josh Sawyer, creative director, known for so many games. I'm pretty sure we have a fantastic um, introduction of your and your what you're doing as well in a couple of minutes. Um, I also want to point out, I'm super excited that at this short notice, I think like it was announced on Thursday or Friday, so many people showed up. So. I think that's really resonating what's happening here in the scene. And I would like to point out that we have special guests today, <laughs> which came from the Slovenian Games Conference, thanks to that day, um, from, to this event here, um, which is Elena Lobova, founder of the Achievers Hub. Hello. Sarko Ledinen, um, who is the creative director at Remedy. And David Helgeson, who is actually the founder of Unity. Um, but we are super excited to hear your talk, Josh. Now, thank you so much for coming all the way to Austria and being part and, um, of what we're doing here and giving an insight of what you're doing. Thank you very so, much. Say hi to Tosh. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that good? All right. Uh, welcome to a talk uh, that I put together a few weeks ago. Uh, this is Leading the Charge, Game Direction on Collaborative Teams. Uh, this is primarily targeted uh, for people who, thank you, Johanna. Um, <laughs> this is primarily targeted at people who are leading teams uh, in a creative capacity. Um, that can be small teams, big teams, all sorts of teams. I know that a lot of student projects often have small teams with someone assigned as a leader, so hopefully you will find uh, some useful information in this talk. First, a little bit of my background and who I am. Uh, I'm Josh Sawyer. I'm the design director at Obsidian Entertainment. I was a designer on Icewind Dale 1 and the lead designer of Icewind Dale 2 and I was the co-lead designer on Neverwinter Nights 2. At Obsidian Entertainment, I was the game director on Fall at New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2, and a canceled project called Aliens Crucible that I will be talking about briefly. Uh, what is a game director? So um, this might seem like an obvious thing, but I've actually found a lot of people don't, aren't really sure what a game director is, or they've heard different def definitions of what a game director is or in practice they've seen game directors behave in a lot of different ways and take on a lot of different responsibilities. So it's worth defining what I'm talking about. Uh, at Obsidian, the game director is the vision holder for the project and the creative authority. So when it comes to the high level concept of what a game is, what it's supposed to be, and what decisions need to be made on it, the game director is the person who is responsible for all of that. In terms of the development structure and the team structure, the game director is considered the, uh, to be at the top in terms of authority. Um, every team has leads, and the director is the lead of the leads. So in addition to your lead programmer, lead artist, uh, lead designer, you also have a game director who is above them in terms of resolving conflicts and making decisions. And like I said, they're the arbiter of high-level conflicts. So in any case, when, um, let's say, the programming lead disagrees with the design lead, or anything like that, uh, you will have the director come in to, well, if they can't resolve it on their own, then the director comes in to give them direction, explain why making one decision or another is important, and then moving the team forward. So a few other things about game directors. Uh, they may or may not implement code and content. content. So on some teams, a director is, is, I shouldn't say simply, the only thing a game director does is really provide high-level vision and feedback. They are not designing systems. They are not doing code. They are not implementing features themselves. They are at the top of the structure reviewing and giving feedback on where the game should go. They may or may not be the public face of the team. So at some companies and with some teams, the creative director or the game director is the person who's talking to the public about the game all the time, um, talking to the press a lot. Other companies that shared among developers or it's something that's handled by a PR team. It really depends on the structure of the team and what the, the publisher wants to do, if there is a publisher. They generally play the game more than any other developer because they're the ones providing the highest level feedback about where the game should go and what it should be. And most importantly, they're primarily concerned with the experience of the game, not the logistics of getting the game done. Um, I usually view production and game direction as being in antagonistic relationships. 
not a hostile relationship, but they are fundamentally opposed to each other. Production wants to get something done on time and schedule. Uh, the directors want everything in the world. They want the greatest thing for the best experience. And between them, they have to actually come down to earth and work in reality. Um, game directors aren't always necessary. There are a lot of teams that operate without someone who is in a position that is considered to be superior to the other developers. Um, there are very small teams that simply don't use them at all. Um, often these are people that have worked together over a long period of time and they have a very good working relationship with each other where they don't really need someone who has a, an authority over anyone else. Um, some teams just develop relationships that allow them to navigate these conflicts whenever they come up. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, there are cases where it really isn't that important to have a game director. Um, the larger the teams get, in my experience, the more important a director is and the more valuable they are to what's happening on the team. Um, so a few things about directorial styles. It's important to note what this talk is really about. So if, if I were to sort of divide up uh, directorial styles into two broad categories, you have dictators and you have collaborators. Um, there are directors who know exactly what they want, or at least they think they know exactly what they want, um, and they're certainly going to tell you what they want, and they don't really want a lot of collaboration. They want someone to execute the ideas that they have and see it in the game, and if they don't like what they see, they'll tell you to do something else. Um, this talk is about the collaborator style of director. This is what I prefer to be. Um, it's not that I don't tell people what to do, but I prefer to also uh, make that a dialogue that happens throughout development. Um, I think it produces something that the people on the team feel much more invested in, and ultimately I think it makes it a richer uh, experience for the players in the end. So this talk is not about creative inspiration, it's about collaboration. Um, I'm not gonna tell you where to go to find inspiration, creative ideas, how to come up with an idea for a game in the first place. That's a whole different set of problems. Uh, this is really about once you're making a game and you know the direction that you're going in, how to work with other people on your team so that they feel invested um, in the process itself. So there are a number of things that I thought about that would be uh, very important for being a collaborative director, and I'm gonna go over each of these in turn. First, it's important to focus on the player or audience experience. The experience is the thing that people actually go through. Um, players don't play a design doc. They don't play ideas in your head. They play a game that you put in front of them and they have an experience that comes out of it. So whenever possible, think and talk in terms of the player experience, not personal opinions. Because unless each one of you is going to buy a million copies of your game, it's ultimately not that important. Uh, set and discuss goals early. Um, goals are extremely, extremely important. They're one of the most important things, I think, when it comes to design in general, and especially at the top level of creative direction on a project. Setting goals helps people understand what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and there may be cases where people don't really understand why you're doing something, and if you can go back to goals, goals really help focus people on the reason behind any particular thing that you're doing. Be flexible about your methodology. Um, directors need to be very well versed in every aspect of development, but we can't be experts in everything. So there are, th there are going to be times where you know what you want to accomplish, but you don't know how to do it and you need to rely on the people on your team and their individual uh, areas of expertise to help you figure out the right methodology to approach that. You need to provide a creative framework for others. So there is a space between a dictator saying, do exactly this, and no direction whatsoever, which is providing a creative framework. That is to say, give examples of things that are in the realm of what you want, describe the goals, and let that framework allow people to work forward toward that goal. Critique things through the goals that you've established. Whenever someone puts in a new feature, a new level, a new character, when you review it critically, evaluate it through the context of the goals that you've established. The goals become a lens during development through which you can view and critique things. It's a more or less objective way to view the things that people are putting into the game, and it allows you to remove the individual egos from the process and focus on what you're trying to collectively accomplish. Solicit contributions from the team. Uh, not everyone is a super um, aggressive person who's gonna get up in your face and tell you all their ideas. A lot of people can be intimidated by authority or feel uh, maybe due to past experiences working with people that their input is not valuable. Um, you should talk to people and ask their opinions and ask for their ideas on things uh, whenever it seems prudent to do so. Even if you don't wind up using those ideas, the process itself can be very rewarding both for you and for the people on the team. And finally, just give a little. 
Sometimes people want something in a game, and you might resist it a little bit, but if you calm down and think about it rationally, you might find that there are a lot of creative things that people on the team can add that you wouldn't have thought of in the first place. So first we're gonna talk about the audience experience. Uh, this is one of the most important things that I think about when making games. Um, this is really a design-oriented approach. It says, what are the needs of our audience? For Like we're making a product that has, or a game that has certain needs for our audience, and what are the constraints that we have to deal with? This is any, any form of design. You can say furniture design, car design. You're making something for an audience. They have certain needs and expectations, and you have certain restrictions on what you can actually practically do. Um, when you think about the player or the audience experience, um, it doesn't mean that you need to make them happy, because that's impossible. Your audience cannot be made entirely happy. But when you think about their needs and expectations, it means that when you make decisions, you're making informed decisions with certain trade-offs. You know that certain players are not going to like certain things. Other players are going to enjoy it a lot. Um, it's about being conscientious about the choices that you make and the impact that it has on the people who play your game. Many player types make up the audience. Sometimes people will talk about the player. There is not a player. Um, there is an audience that has a broad range of tastes and attitudes. Um, you have casual players, hardcore players. Even within the hardcore audience, especially I work in role-playing games, there are many different types of hardcore role-playing gamers. Um, so understanding and identifying the different types of players and their tastes and thinking about that and talking about it in terms of your goals is very important, not just for yourself, but for the rest of the team. Because when they make decisions, they have to understand that what they're doing is going to impact the experience for the player. And again, it allows you to step back from individual egos. Um, some of the most difficult arguments I've seen take place in game development happen when people start talking about what they like or don't like. Who cares? I mean, like, it's an interesting thing for about that long, but ultimately, again, um, those people aren't going to buy a million copies of the game. And while I'm not saying that you should work on things that you hate, ultimately, what any one of us individually likes or dislikes is not incredibly important. You should be passionate about the things that you're working on, but you should also understand that this is something you're making for a larger group of people outside of yourself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which I thought about the player and audience experience in a few of the games I worked on. Uh, so in Fallout New Vegas, we had to think about an audience that was actually fairly broad. Uh, there were two major categories and a minor category. First was Fallout 3 fans. Um, when I worked at Black Isle Studios, we were you know, coming off of Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. And so the game that we were making at Black Isle was really to appeal to Fallout 1 and 2 fans. But it had been years and years and years. And Bethesda had made Fallout 3. The game that we were making was made in their engine. And we had to understand and accept that first and foremost, the people who were going to be playing Fallout New Vegas were going to be Fallout 3 players. But we also knew that there were a lot of people who recognized that people at Obsidian had worked at Black Isle Studios, that either we had worked on Fallout 1 or 2, or we had worked on Van Buren, which was the original Fallout 3. So we knew there were people out there that were very enthusiastic about the idea that Obsidian was working on a game and seeing some things come back that they really loved in the first two games. And then finally, we had people who were really excited about the idea of Golden Era Rat Pack Vegas. This is the Las Vegas of the 50s and 60s which is very neon and gaudy and crazy and full of Frank Sinatra and all those crazy guys. So that was another group of people that we knew we kind of had to appeal to in certain ways. So the things that we did based on these understandings of what the audience were, were we said that Fallout 3 should be a refinement, not a reinvention of what Fallout 3 was. Um, this was also important because we only had 18 months to make the game. But um, <laughs> in addition to the practical constraints, we knew that people coming to Fallout New Vegas were liked Fallout 3 for the most part. So we shouldn't fundamentally change what that experience was. Instead, we should say, how can we take the experience that Bethesda made and try to just make it better so that people enjoy uh, the gameplay that they saw in the game prior and just think it's an evolution of that. In terms of uh, making the Fallout 1 and 2 fans happy, we thought in terms of the setting and the characters and the factions. Um, there were lots of characters we brought back from the first two games or descendants like Cassidy, who's the daughter of Cassidy from Fallout 2, Marcus, um, factions like the Followers of the Apocalypse. These are all things that it was very easy for us to bring back. And even though it wasn't going back to a top-down, turn-based combat system, it was bringing back some of these beloved characters that really made players happy. 
And then trying to capture 1960s Las Vegas is all about neon, uh, what's called googie architecture, gambling, prostitution, and of course Elvis. Um, one side note that I will say is I hate, I don't like Las Vegas. <laughs> um, I really don't like most casino gambling games. Um, I th yes, they're not good. But I designed and, and implemented with the programmers a whole bunch of gambling games because I understood that to make a Fallout game, which had previously had gambling, set in Las Vegas and not have gambling would seem kind of silly. And so as much as it kind of irritated me to put these things in, I knew that it was very important for fulfilling the expectation of the audience. That's really important. Um, if, if that had been the entirety of the game, I probably would have been really irritated. But I recognize this is just a small part. This will make people very happy. It will fit the atmosphere. It will be good. And so I made that choice. Setting goals. Uh, how many of you here know the story of Bring Me the Rock in management? All right, nobody, awesome. Um, so Bring Me the Rock is like this very awful style of direction and management where someone in charge says, bring me a rock. And a person goes, okay. And they go out and they get a rock and they bring it back. And the person says, no, not a black rock. I want a blue rock. And you go, okay. And then you go out and you get a blue rock and you bring it back and they go, not a big blue rock. I need a small blue rock. And you go out and you get a small blue rock and you bring it back and the guy says, I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't need a smooth small blue rock. I need a rough small blue rock. And this is, this is a sort of uh, parable for uh, just bad direction. Like if you don't really set expectations from the beginning and what you're trying to accomplish, all you do is really frustrate and confound people. They do work without really understanding what they're supposed to be accomplishing. And in the end, it just burns everyone out. It frustrates the person who's in charge because they don't understand why these stupid people can't figure out what they want. Uh, and it's just generally bad. Setting goals is a way to avoid bring me the rock. Goals that you establish can be broad or they can be specific. And they're often about um, achieving a feeling or promoting a certain type of player behavior. Again, games are about experiences more than anything else. And when you think about goals in terms of the feelings you want to evoke or the types of behavior that you want uh, the player to exhibit and the decisions they want to make, um, it starts to frame the sort of decisions you make about developing the game a lot more um, because there are a lot of different ways to evoke certain emotions. There are a lot of different ways to promote different behaviors. And it doesn't have to always be about this is the one way in which we do this one thing. It can be broader than that. It can be more flexible. And more people on the team can contribute more ideas to the development toward those goals. Um, while you can make goals that are negative in the sense of things to avoid, I find that it's often more useful to make positive goals to move towards. So for example, if there's something in game, in a genre of games that you really don't like, and you just say like, we're not gonna do that, don't ever do anything like this, that can be useful because it tells people what you're not trying to do, but that's not really inspirational. It just says, well, don't go there. Um, so if you say something like, don't have any taverns in games. I hate taverns, they're so cliche. Great, that's a thing you've said, but what are we doing? I know what we're not doing, I don't know what we are doing. So um, you can use negative examples to a certain extent. It can be good to avoid things if you think they're cliche or they detract from the experience. But if you give positive examples of like, we really want to create a feeling of elation when you get to this point of the game, or we really want to promote the player switching weapons when they get into combat against different types of creatures, those are positive examples that help people understand what you're trying to move towards. It's very important that people be allowed to question goals. Um, earlier is better than later. <laughs> Because if you're working for a long time under a certain set of goal assumptions and then halfway through development people say, why are we doing this anyway? Um, that's not that good. But the earlier people on the team question the goals that you have, the earlier the opportunity you have to either convince them and help them understand why those goals are important or to let them convince you your ideas are actually stupid <laughs> and that you should think of different goals or reframe those goals or rephrase those goals to be more easily understood. Um, so they can and they should be questioned. Um, even late in development, you can actually wind up in a point where you say, is this goal really worth accomplishing? Um, because sometimes goals wind up being very expensive in, in the pursuit of accomplishing them. And if they're not really that important, you still have to allow that certain goals can drop off development. You can say, you know what, we have like six things we were trying to accomplish with this game. We got five of them that we feel really good about and the sixth is not really that strong and people are kind of skeptical that we're ever gonna get it. 
and people bring it up, you have to allow those discussions, and sometimes that means you have to cut that thing, or sometimes it means you have to put more effort into it. But allow goals to be questioned, it's very important. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Mojave Wasteland and the high-level goals that I had for it in Fallout New Vegas. So I wanted to capture the feeling of the Mojave Desert specifically. Um, there are lots of deserts in the United States, and they look very different, and they feel very different, and so I was very clear don't put saguaro cacti from the Sonoran Desert in here. I really want Joshua trees. I really want these types of plants. I really want this type of terrain because I want it to feel like the desert that is around Las Vegas. Um, not that everyone in California is the most important market for this game, but people drive to Las Vegas all the time and they know what that desert looks like. And so right away when I was seeing things that really looked inappropriate in that desert, like it's not the Sahara, it's not a bunch of dunes rolling over each other. I said it's very important that we capture the feeling of the Mojave Desert, which is a lot of different things. Sound, visuals, visual effects, the color of the sky. Um, and also to try to draw period parallels from the 1950s and 60s with the golden era of Las Vegas. So we had to try to find a way, because Fallout is, part of it is the appeal is retro future, kind of going back to the 50s and the 60s as you know, sort of bringing that into the future. So if New Vegas was going to have the feeling of kind of the Rat Pack brought into the post-apocalyptic world, we need some sort of equivalent in the desert to help maintain that feeling instead of just kind of feeling like a bombed out wasteland. So how did we get that desert feeling one is that the world builders, uh, we had a team of three very talented world builders. They focused very heavily on um, developing the wide open spaces and mountain ranges that the desert is really known for. They used US Geological Survey uh, height map data to actually map out the world. Um, obviously the scale is not the same, so we had to kind of tweak it a lot. It was pretty funny, we actually took all that USGS data and we shrunk it down to 125th scale. And then the funny thing is that the Colorado River, which comes south from Lake Mead, uh, was actually um, narrow enough that you could jump across it <laughs> because the scale had been brought down so much. So then we just cut a line through it and then pushed it out. Um, so wide open spaces were things that uh, the world builders really focused on because I took a tour on my motorcycle through the desert. I took tons of reference photos and they're like, wow, this is really flat. Uh, by the way, that engine, the Bethesda's engine is not great at doing flat environments. Don't, don't get mad at me, Todd. Um, <laughs> but there's a reason why Fallout 3 has rolling terrain. Fallout 3 has lots of rolling terrain. Um, in New Vegas, we had very flat terrain, and very quickly the level of details would drop off. And, but it did feel like the Mojave Desert. Um, I was very insistent uh, that the art team research uh, plants that actually grow in that desert. We got a lot of reference books. Uh, they put Joshua trees. They put all of these native plants that had grown in the area for centuries. And it really did feel like if you just... If you rode your car down uh, I-15 up into Las Vegas and got out of your car, that's what it would look like. Uh, the other thing we did is we used lots of cowboy-inspired clothing and weapons. Um, that might seem kind of weird because the cowboy era was the end of the 19th century. But in the United States, in the 50s and 60s, westerns were extremely popular. And so it actually managed to kind of evoke a feeling that was similar to that era of Vegas. Um, and they're cool. <laughs> Um, and the other thing is we put what are called Usonian homes on the outskirts of Vegas. These were not fancy homes. These were very practical homes built in the 50s in the United States, and they helped actually transition from this kind of Western-feeling environment into the city of Vegas itself. And these were all choices that the art directors and the world builders made based on my direction of capture the feeling of this desert in these ways. I worked on a canceled aliens project called Aliens Crucible. And no one seems to care if I talk about it now, um, because it's been a really long time. And this was a game that was based on the Aliens franchise, and it was a role-playing game. And uh, there were certain things that I wanted to accomplish in terms of the character designs that I thought were very important. Um, Alien, uh, the original Alien, all the characters were blue-collar workers. Uh, they weren't fancy people. They were laborers working on an ore refining ship. Um, they were talking about union dues and shares and all these other things that were very like sort of down to earth things. And so I wanted their outfits of the characters that we had to be very practical, blue collar looking. And then aliens, James Cameron's aliens had uh, colonial marines, androids, and company agents. And so I wanted to evoke the feeling that those characters did. At the same time, oh, I should say, uh, a key word that I used for this is that they should feel grounded. They shouldn't feel fantastic. They should really feel like people that exist in this world and 
are just like they're common people working in, in, this, in this environment. But we also wanted to avoid feeling dated. Uh, Alien was made in the late 70s. Uh, Aliens was made in the mid 80s. Uh, there are a lot of features of them that look very dated and it's kind of hard to update them without feeling, without lo we wanted to update them without losing the spirit of the franchise. Um, the other thing that we noticed when looking at characters in those films is that there were a variety of ethnicities, body types, and shapes. Um, again, because humans are very, human characters are very central to this franchise, it was very important that we give them a range of physical characteristics so they feel more like real people. These are some of the characters that Brian Menzi, a really fantastic concept artist, came up with based on, on high-level directions that I gave him. Um, the features that these characters exhibit are a combination of details I provided and things that Brian added in because he just thought they fit the, the mood of the character. Um, the character on the left, Raja, I had the idea that she was um, uh, an Indian British woman who was an archeologist uh, working on this planet and that she was dressed very practically and Brian came up with most of her design elements. Um, I believe he came up with her jumpsuit. He came up with the coloration. Um, he added her scarf to help in conversations really draw attention to her neck. Um, the character next to her, Echo, is an android. Um, the only direction I think I gave Brian about Echo was that she kind of looked like Grace Kelly. So he made her very, very like sort of blonde, blue-eyed, fair skin. Um, but then a lot of the other elements Brian just came up with on, on his own. Um, I don't know if you can see the details that clearly, but there's a lot of ribbing on her outfit. Um, Brian did that to make her, um, her outfit kind of look like cabling, like IDE cabling in a, in a, in a computer case. Um, the uh, sort of sockets around the elbows and at the, at the ankle were to give the impression of an articulated joint on a doll of some sort. So these were just little things that he did that I didn't give any direction on, but he was like trying to make her look like an android while making her look like this very kind of um, beautiful woman. Uh, and I, I was super happy with what he came up with. Uh, the woman next to her is Captain Warner. He went back to the designs of the Nostromo from Alien. Um, he changed the color palette. Uh, the detail I gave for this was woman was that she was um, an Asian woman and she had a Ukrainian plate. Um, I think this actually was sometime after the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, and so I was seeing um, the Timoshenko with the, the braid over her hair. So I thought it would be interesting on this character, but everything else Brian came up with. And then um, the character on the right um, is Pope, and she's a Marine, and we had thought we should probably have a very physically strong Marine. Um, uh, people really like Vasquez in, in Aliens because she's an awesome character. Um, one of the things that makes her very awesome is she's extremely physically strong. But we said, like, well, we shouldn't really copy Vasquez. And there are a lot of things about Vasquez that we wanted to avoid uh, just because we didn't want to directly copy a character. So we had this idea of, like, what if she were kind of like a rockabilly-like lady? Um, and we were talking about, like, well, you know, would she actually, like, do her hair and wear makeup? And we're like, oh, I guess that sounds kind of unrealistic. But we had a guy on our team who uh, was in the U.S. Army, and he had actually been in Iraq, and he was like, a lot of women in the field actually put on makeup. Like, not necessarily in a combat zone, but like, they actually do put on makeup and, and they do their hair. Um, so he said it's not really that unrealistic. Uh, so he said, okay, we can do that, but then we also made the choice that over time, once things started getting worse for her as a character, her hair would get messier and messier and her makeup, like she wouldn't reapply it when aliens were attacking. Um, so she had this sort of visual, like, standard that she wanted to uphold, but as soon as things got serious, she became very serious and was like, okay, I'm not doing my makeup anymore. Um, and then the, the, he added lots of little details, like her, um, the scarf on her wrist, and then the eye target colonists was my idea, just because I thought it was funny. She's kind of a fatalistic character. Um, these are some of the characters as executed in Engine. I was really happy with how they came out. Um, three of the characters, uh, Pope in the upper left, Echo in the bottom center, and Raja in the upper right are based off the concepts from the pre previous page. Um, as you can see, Pope, all of her makeup is pretty much gone and her hair is a little more messy, so that's when she's in like alien fighting mode. But um, all those things that uh, Brian and I came up with were based off of these basic ground rules of what we wanted to accomplish with the characters, combined with a few specific details that were then fleshed out by both of us. Um, I don't think that if I had given Brian <clears throat> Brian is a guy who does not like to be given no direction. He really wants some strong direction. But also Brian contributed very cool details like Echo's outfit and all that stuff that I thought were really brilliant. 
So that's an example of sort of setting goals and uh, allowing the people involved in it to work towards them together. Having a flexible methodology is very important. So <clears throat> I'm, not a, I'm not a programmer. I, am, um, I have tried programming. I'm very bad at it. Um, I am an OK artist. I actually wanted to be an illustrator for quite a while, but I'm not that good at it. I can sketch things out and then hand them to artists, real artists, and say, please do like this, but, you know, <laughs> more arty. And, um, and so there's a lot of times where I'll say, I, like, I, I do know what we're trying to do. I don't know exactly how to get there. And it's very important that um, I have to remain flexible. I'll say, look, just trust me. I think this goal is important. I think we should try to get here. Help me figure out how to get here. Um, really flexible about, uh, methodology is about letting the team help you figure out how you're going to get where you want to go. <clears throat> how do we get where we're going? Directors can't be experts in everything, like I said. Um, Every director comes to it with a different background. <clears throat> maybe they were a programmer before, maybe they were an artist, maybe they were a designer, maybe they're just a creative person that has a lot of money and they became a director. Um, so your level of knowledge is limited though. You can't really be an expert in, in every single thing. So you have to rely on people. Um, if you remain focused on a goal um, without being very strict and specific about the methodology of it, you can rely on the expertise of the people on your team, which is why you hired them <laughs> or why you're working with them, so that they can help you solve that problem. Um, I'll give a few examples from things that I've worked on and how I tried to step back when I realized that I was at the limitations of my own knowledge. Uh, so Dead Fire, uh, which is the sequel to Pillars of Eternity, has a customizable AI system. In Pillars 1, some people were frustrated by the limitations of the AI. Uh, also, our designers were a little frustrated by the limitations of the AI on the enemy side. So we decided to completely revise our AI system and make it better for uh, the designers and also allow players to customize it. This is the thing that was, it was one of the most popular features in Deadfire. So we knew that it was going to be used both by designers to make creatures and it was going to be used by players. So right away I said this has to be a system that is fundamentally able to be accessed and used by end users as well as people on the team. Uh, I said that the interface that the players used did not need to actually be the same as what the designers used but it needed to essentially have parity in terms of feature functionality. What I didn't want to have happen is players observe behavior in AI on enemies that they weren't able to use on their own characters, because that's frustrating. You're like, cool, the enemies can do stuff that I can't do at all. Um, and I said that it should be generally like Final Fantasy XII Gambits and Dragon Age Origins AI. This is something that I understood, understood through use. I didn't understand very deeply on a technical level. Um, and so in the end, most of the design and engineering was handled by the system designers who did the implementation on the creature side and by the programmers who engineered it. I said, I don't use these systems. I don't actually know how important any, give, any individual uh, behavior is. I don't know how important any individual condition is. Um, I don't know the right way to set up the interface in a way that's going to be really useful for the designers. Um, I have some examples from what players can use. But in the end, I don't know what is ultimately going to be the best way to do this. Uh, so I said, you guys, you guys use this every day. You guys have already dealt with the AI system and you know you need to refactor it. So just focus on these goals and I'm going to trust in you that you're going to do a great job. And they did. Um, so this is a screenshot of our behavior editor in game at the end. It was a very robust system. Uh, it was a little intimidating for people at first, but uh, we added some more features later that made it much more user friendly. It was very powerful. It was much more powerful than the AI in the first game. Uh, it's one of the most popular features that we put in Deadfire. Um, there's lots of mods associated with it up on um, Nexus and things like that. So overall, this was a case where I feel like if I would have actually stepped in and been like more heavy-handed with exactly how it would have been, I think my instincts would have been wrong. I think I would have actually led them down the wrong path. Um, and it was a case where recognizing my own limitations but knowing what my goal was allowed me to let them do really great work. So it's up to um, David Simchek and Nick Carver and all the guys who worked on that team. They really did all this work and they did an amazing job. Provide a creative framework for people. So the idea here is that sources of inspiration become points of reference for people. Um, if you manage people in a very heavy-handed fashion where you tell them exactly what you want them to do, they can feel very creatively restrained because they are being very creatively restrained. 
Um, and also, they don't really understand necessarily uh, what the big picture is. If you're very, 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 very specific, they don't necessarily understand the spirit of the thing that you're trying to accomplish. If you provide a framework of reference, you will see that people start to kind of get a general sense of the stuff that you want, which ultimately allows them to be a little more creative and they're actually more on the same wavelength with you. Uh, framework provides guidance, but it allows creativity. Um, there are a lot of developers who you might think, I'll just give them complete freedom. A lot of developers, like Brian, the concept artist that I work with, um, he does not like being given complete freedom. It actually pisses him off. <laughs> So um, he really wants some strong direction, um, but he also doesn't want to be told exactly what to do. So if you give them a framework, it's uh, guidance for, with creativity. So some of the ways in which uh, I've tried to work on this process, uh, one is with the aesthetics of the original Pillars of Eternity. So we wanted to pull inspiration from Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition artwork. Um, we picked this era because that was the era of the Infinity Engine games. And we also picked it because the art style is actually quite a bit different from fantasy as shown in the mid-2000s and on, uh, where it became much more exaggerated, much more colorful. Materials started to like, look less like individual materials and more like um, spray-painted foam in a lot of cases. A lot, sorry, like a lot of concept art really loses it, its material definition. So we said, let's go back to second edition AD&D art and try to pull from that aesthetic. Um, our art director, Rob Nessler, was very interested in trying to evoke the feeling of the Hudson River School of Art. These are beautiful landscapes that use relatively muted but dramatic colors. Um, we use this as reference for how our lighting and color schemes within the environment should, should be used. And then also we knew that we wanted a skeuomorphic graphic user interface. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, skeuomorphism is where um, a representational object actually has the physical appearance and, and sort of feeling of a, of a physically material object. So this is like the old version of iOS, like how long ago is that, five or six years ago, where Apple made things look like they were made, like a clock was a physical clock. Um, things look like they were made out of wood and stone and that you were actually pressing a button that was a physical button. Um, that's something that was very common in the Infinity Engine games. All the interfaces looked like they were made out of metal and stone and wood, so we wanted to evoke that feeling as well. So here are some of the references that we gave to the team. Um, the one on the left was very instrumental in our overall character, weapon, and armor design. This is actually the very first color image that appears in the second edition AD&D Player's Handbook. It's called Dragon Slayers and Proud of It by Larry Elmore. <laughs> and uh, it does a lot of things that I think are really cool. Um, the character designs have fantastic elements, but they're actually relatively subdued. The colors are not incredibly vibrant. vibrant. They have a little bit of saturation, but they're not really blown out. Uh, the scale of everything is just kind of brought down. Also, the women in the picture are wearing practical armor, which is not necessarily that common if you get about 10 years later. Um, so these are all things that I said, these are important things. Like, we're not trying to make an ultra-realistic game, but we're trying to make something that feels more realistic than fantasy that was contemporary at the time that we started making Pillars. Uh, the Hudson River, River School, that's a very uh, exemplary sort of image. Um, it's very sort of like the, the, the lighting is not really bright and intense. It's more subdued. The colors overall are a little muted. That was the vibe we wanted to go with. And then below you see examples from Icewind Dale 2 and Planescape Torment. I think that's actually Planescape Torment's enhanced edition, so I cheated a little bit. But, um, but you get the impression of things that are actually made out of stone, made out of metal, user interfaces that are not wireframes but are physical objects. And these are examples of how people executed on those ideas. Um, there are two of our portraits. They're painted portraits. They're a huge pain in the ass. They take us forever. <laughs> they're very expensive. Um, but, they're, but they're what all the Infinity Engine games had. They had painted portraits. Um, these don't look exactly like Larry Elmore's piece, but they're very evocative of the overall material, lighting, uh, color palettes used. Uh, that environment is a sort of muted uh, landscape that we thought was very appropriate for the type of game we were making. And then that uh, inventory in the lower right corner, that's actually from Deadfire. Uh, that was a lot of fun to make, but it was also a big pain in the butt because I asked the artist to look at Balinese wood carving. And if you've ever looked at Balinese wood carving, it's extremely intricate. And so every single interface element had to have these very curly little swirly things in it. Um, but it's very beautiful and it, lo and it looks like the whole thing is carved out of like teak wood or something like that. And it really, really was awesome. The artist did a great job. Another place where I provided points of reference that really, um, in an unexpected way, helped motivate, motivate the team is on pillars uh, with constructed languages. 
So I maybe spent a little too much time developing constructed languages in Pillars 1 and 2. For those of you unfamiliar with constructed languages, it's stuff like Klingon or Cinderin. These aren't languages that are naturally created in the world, but that people constructed uh, for fantasy or other purposes or for fun. Um, and so in Pillars 1, I developed the foundations for three constructed languages, Valian, uh, Eldadirin, and uh, Glanfothan. And these were based off of Earth languages and then tweaked, and they had their own little grammars and stuff like that. And I felt that it helped really make the world feel more like uh, distinct groups of cultures. And it was pretty neat. And it was too much work, but I did it anyway. And they were in the game, and, they were, and they, we used them in the game for when characters from those cultures talked. They would use those phrases and things like that, and it was fun. And then um, that framework and that documentation and that general aesthetic uh, inspired a new designer on the team to create a new constructed language. So she had to write this character named Rekka, and Rekka was from a land that no one in the game was familiar with. And when he first appeared in the game, he doesn't speak any language that anyone understands. And so Kate, the writer, she was like, can I make a constructed language for Rekka? And I was like, if you have time, you can make a constructed language for Rekka. And she actually did it on her own time. She not only um, developed the language and the grammar, but she also uh, created the orthography, so the alphabet that uh, Seki used. And it was very cool. And when you first meet him, he actually speaks entirely in Seki, this made-up language. It was an awesome thing. And all she did, really, is she looked at, she looked at the framework that I had provided for the other languages. And then she used other tools that she found to more rapidly develop uh, the language. Um, and that's a case where providing certain creative points of inspiration can inspire other people on the team to do their own thing. I think that actually her constructed language was created in a much smarter and faster way than I had created mine uh, because she knew of tools that I didn't, uh, but it worked out really well. And you can see here examples on the left. Those are the orthographies that I created for constructed languages in the first game. And then on the right is the, yeah, she just hand wrote it out. Um, she illustrated all the the characters for Seki. The Seki alphabet is extremely, extremely complicated. Uh, thanks, Kate. <laughs> so critiquing through goals, uh, very, very important. When you critique any content, um, if you use goals as the way by which you judge uh, whether a, a feature or a piece of content is good, that's an objective lens for viewing that system, those systems and that content. Um, it allows people to step back from individual egos and opinions and really say, is this feature or is this content helping us get closer to what we're trying to accomplish in this game? Um, it's also a way to reinforce and refine goals. When you critique things by talking about the goals, you remind people that you have goals. <laughs> so you might say, like, hey, remember six months ago when we said we were setting out to make the player feel really frightened whenever this sort of thing happened? We're still trying to do that. And so when we look at this level, let's talk about that and the ways in which this succeeds and fails to do that. Um, so here are a few examples uh, of the ways in which I've encountered this. First, um, Deadfire had a multi-classing system, and it was a big, big part of the campaign. I made a big old video where I went over it in extreme detail, and people were like, wow, that sounds amazing. And then shortly after, we realized it wasn't really going to work. Uh, I had goals to capture the feeling of third edition D&D &D multi-classing, which means that every time you level up, you can pick a new class. You can go back, you can say, I want three levels of fighter and a level of rogue, and now I want two more levels of fighter, and now I want a level of wizard. And it's very flexible, and it's really crazy, and allows you to make all sorts of wild characters. And we said, we want to allow you to make up to three character classes back and forth, however you want. We had a goal of avoiding trap, meaning non-viable builds. Uh, one problem with third edition multi-classing, in my opinion, and I think most people's opinion, is that it's very easy to multi-class and make a terrible character that is not viable. Um, I hear a lot of laughing because people know this is true. Um, <laughs> so multi-classing is very powerful, but it's also, if you don't know what you're doing, you can make just this, these really awful characters. And I was like, I don't, I don't want that to happen. I don't think that's a, a good thing to support. We should try to make as many characters viable as possible, and we should not let the multi-classing system make non-viable characters. Give people a neat hybrid title. So this is something that I, I found on Pillars 1. Um, there was someone on our, on our message boards who said, hey, do you guys have sorcerers in pillars? And I was like, we have wizards. He's like, yeah, but could we have sorcerers? And I was like, well, I mean, like D&D sorcerers? And he's like, yeah. I said, I mean, our wizards basically are sorcerers, more or less. Like, they're more, they're more like D&D sorcerers than they are like D&D wizards. And he was kind of like, so we're not going to get sorcerers? <laughs> and... 
And I was like, okay, I just, and I sort of logically broke it down. I'm like, okay, dude, so we just went back and forth and I said that mechanically these guys work like sorcerers, but they're wizards. So what do you, what do you need? And he's like, I just want my character sheet to say sorcerer. <laughs> and I was like, that's valid. And so with multi-classing, I realized that for every multi-classing combination, we could create a hybrid title. Um, with two classes, that's 55 titles. Um, with three classes, it's like 200 some titles. So that was maybe a little stupid, but um, people really liked the idea of if they make a fighter and a wizard, that's a battle mage. If they make a barbarian and a chanter, that's a howler. Um, and some of the titles are really cool and some are silly and people just really like the idea. They like the idea that their character had a special title. Um, and the last one was ultimate flexibility. I said, this is a goal where you can make whatever you want and combine things in all sorts of crazy ways. And there were lots of problems. So there's an edge case where if you took 19 levels in one class and uh, one level in another class, you would get some really weird balance issues. There's also a 16, 3, 1. 16 levels in one class, three in another, one in a third. And it wound up being a big mess. There were these really bad min-maxing gaps. It was not accomplishing the goal of making viable characters, uh, all of them viable. It was a big problem. So ultimately, it was doing some of what we wanted, but not everything. Um, and what happened was the people implementing this, uh, the system designers brought up all these edge cases, and they really forced the issue. They said, like, do we really want to try to do all these things? Because it doesn't look like we're actually going to be able to do all of them. And at first I was like, oh, make the math work. You know, that's like, like just, just pull numbers and like do all sorts of creative stuff and try to get the math to work. And it wasn't working. And so finally we decided it's, it's, it's time to reevaluate our goals. So we said we're going to drop the goals of ultimate flexibility and level by level multi-classing. We determined that the flexibility was not, it's like kind of a neat sounding goal, but practically it wasn't super important. Um, and also the level by level multi-classing also wasn't really accomplishing anything other than allowing horrible min-maxing. There's plenty of min-maxing in Deadfire. You don't need level by level multi-classing to have more min-maxing. So instead we said, what if we used a second edition AD&D multi-classing system where you just pick two classes at character creation, that is your multi-class, and you advance them together forever. Um, the thing is that still allows for 55 combinations even before subclasses and any other racial combinations or any crazy stuff that you want to do, that's a huge number of characters um, even before you get into individual builds. Um, when we did that, we closed, not all, but we closed an enormous number of min-maxing gaps. Like just removing the third class and removing level by level multi-classing solved a huge amount of problems. Um, it was really uncommon that you could make a character that uh, felt like it was not viable. They might feel like they're a little underpowered, but they could totally play through the game just fine. It, to it reduced a huge number of edge cases because we weren't dealing with all these different variables. It made development easier. It was way easier to implement this system than anything else. And nobody complained. We sh like, so we, I had, like I said, I had made a video at the beginning of the game where I said, like, this is the whole system, and I went into great detail. And then, you know, like nine months later, I said, hey, everybody, remember that thing? Forget it. Um, and I, I explained, like, all the things, and a few people were like, oh. And then by the time the game shipped, no one talked about it. Everyone was excited because they could make a zillion characters and it didn't really matter. By the way, someone will always complain, so I can't really say no one complained. Uh, soliciting contributions is extremely important. Again, some people are not vocal. Um, a person not being vocal doesn't mean that they don't have good ideas. It just means that they're shy or they're not confident or they had a bad experience where they gave a previous director ideas and they were shot down. Um, these are not reasons why a person's ideas shouldn't be considered for going into the game. If you solicit feedback directly from people on the team, um, it really makes uh, the process very inclusive. So this means going to someone and saying, hey, I have this idea about this thing. What do you think about it? Or, hey, um, I'm looking for ideas about what we could put in the final area of the game. What do you think? Again, you don't necessarily use all the ideas that they put out, but you'd be surprised how many interesting insights that people on your team might have about the game that you're making. Again, a few examples. Pillars of Eternity attributes. Um, I designed the whole attribute system in Pillars of Eternity. It was a big pain in the butt because people wanted it to be exactly like D&D and it couldn't really practically be that way. And it was refined over a very long time by a lot of conversations I had with testers on the team. 
So we had our QA staff that was on site. Uh, there were a lot of really smart players on that team who were very insightful. They played a lot of tabletop stuff and they were the biggest min-maxers on our team. And so I'd go to them and I would say, hey, when you build a character, what stats do you bump and what do you drop and why? And we kind of go back and forth and I would say, okay, so if I took this stat and I switched the bonuses that I gave, or if I doubled the bonuses that it gave, would that change how you built your characters? And based off their feedback, I would iterate. Then I'd come back after a week and say, hey, did this practically change how you played the game and made characters? Um, they had a lot of brilliant insights. Um, I really think ultimately one of the most obnoxious things about game development, professional game development, is that testers' feedback often gets ignored. Um, I mean, there are a lot of places where beyond them not being solicited for feedback, their feedback is generally thrown into the garbage and they're not allowed to have contact with devs, which I think is awful. Um, there's a huge range of tester quality and capability. Um, not all testers are great, but often you'll find that there are really great testers. They're the experts on your game. They play it more than anyone else. So if I had not done this process, I do not think I would have been able to refine the attribute system as much as I did, like I said. <laughs> Um, another example is a weapon that went into Deadfire called Street Sweeper. So um, I have made so many unique items in these games over almost 20 years. <laughs> in the original Icewind Dale, I designed every single unique item in the game and I wrote all the descriptions and it's a lot of fun, except it's kind of not that much fun anymore. <laughs> so on Deadfire, I said, anybody else got any ideas? Um, and it was across the whole team. I just said, like, any ideas that you have for crazy things? Because one of the things we found is that while people like powerful items, they also like very distinctive items, unique items. And so one of our testers, uh, Andy Arts, um, he said, I think it'd be really cool if there was a broom weapon in the game. And um, it was funny because he said that, and then another designer said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> that's so silly, because he just didn't like silly stuff. Um, but we put it in, and we put it in as a quarterstaff weapon called Street Sweeper, and uh, it was very funny, and it's actually a very good weapon. Um, there were a number of creative sort of mods we came up with it. One of them is called Spring Cleaning. So every time you hit an enemy with the weapon, if they have any sort of buff effect on them, it reduces the duration by 10% every time you hit them. <laughs> it's actually really, really useful and very powerful, and there aren't many other things in the game that have that effect. And then there was another effect called you can't be serious, where when you hit them, there's a chance that uh, they'll be distracted because you're hitting them with a broom. <laughs> so these were things that were very, like, they're very creative, they make people laugh, but they're also actually really useful in the game, and that's the best sort of thing that we could put in. And it was, and Andy's a tester, and he just had this really funny idea. And then finally, the god challenges. So um, in Deadfire, uh, after it shipped, we wanted to implement uh, these really hardcore challenges for players who were just super min-maxers and they wanted a new crazy challenge. There are special modes. And I started to come up with them, uh, but I was finding myself sort of stuck mechanically on certain things because these are supposed to be things that you opt into and they have a big, broad effect across the whole game. Um, so what I did is I went to Kate Dollarhide, who is one of our narrative designers. She's not a system designer at all, and I actually think this is something that worked in our favor. I'm too, like too ingrained in the mechanics of the game. I'm too like bitter and jaded about like how role-playing games work. And she's kind of like, I don't know how the game works or like I kind of understand it, but she really understood the gods because she wrote them. And so I said, what do you think would be an appropriate thematic challenge for Barith? What do you think would be an appropriate thematic challenge for Abaddon? And it actually was pretty cool because even though she didn't really understand the mechanics obviously as thoroughly as I did because I made most of them, um, she had these insights into things that were thematically appropriate, uh, that were really neat, and one of them that came through was, uh, there is a little orphan from the first game. So basically in the first game, there's a quest where you can wind up with a baby in your inventory, and a lot of people forgot to complete the quest and return the baby. And so we actually had a slide at the end of the game that talked about how inexplicably you took a baby through the end dungeon <laughs> and now you're responsible for them. Um, so at the beginning of Deadfire, there's actually this orphaned little girl on your ship and you're like, oh, oh that's right, I did that. Um, um, there's, a, uh, there's a goddess of motherhood named Helia who uh, her challenge was actually that you have to, Helia or um, Vela, the orphan, she 
instead of staying on the ship, she follows you through the whole game. And enemies will try to kill her. You can't control her, but you can protect her. And if she dies, the game ends. That's it. So it's something that was actually very simple in concept. It was very appropriate for the goddess of motherhood. Um, and it created this really interesting challenge for players. But that was just something where, where Kate helped me sort of come up with this idea. And finally, uh, just give a little, like, let go. Let people put neat things into the game that they think are cool. So uh, I like to use the phrase, hold on tightly, let go lightly. Like, you should have a vision. You should stick to that vision. But, like, don't, don't choke it to death. Sometimes you have to just, like, give and go, like, Okay, you can, you can do this thing. Um, so there may be times on a project where someone wants to do something and it seems a little silly or it seems a little weird or it doesn't quite seem to be in your vision of what the game is, but you should step back and say like, if we let the person do this, what's the worst thing that could happen? So what this, what this means is you should really evaluate what the true cost of failure is. So if there's something that's a little risky that you're a little bit uncomfortable with, but you say, you know what? I it's ultimately probably not going to be that big of a deal, then just let them try it. If it's not going to disrupt the schedule and it's not going to really screw the game up even if it doesn't work out, then just let them do it. Because if it works out, they'll be very happy. Your game will be richer for it. If it doesn't work out, you let them do it. They experimented. They saw that it wasn't working out and they reached that conclusion with you. Little things can mean a lot to people. Um, that's the thing is like, especially when you have really big teams, um, you can get people who do a lot of low level work they're kind of in trenches, and they don't necessarily feel like they're contributing that much as individuals to the project. And when they have an idea that they're really excited about, um, if you always swat those things down, it can be extremely demoralizing. You want people to be excited to work on your teams and on your projects. And sometimes that person who's in the trenches has a neat little idea. I mean, like Andy, the guy who came with that broom, he's like, this is like the happiest time of his life. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration, but he's, he was a very, very happy that Street Sweeper went in the game. So here are a few examples. Uh, Fall at New Vegas had a thing called Wild Wasteland. How many of you know what Wild Wasteland is? All right. So the Fallout franchise, the first two games especially were pretty silly in a lot of ways, and they had a lot of pop culture references and a lot of things that kind of broke the fourth wall. And um, some players really love it, some really don't. And as we started developing stuff for Fallout New Vegas, some developers started putting, they were like, I'm going to put a Monty Python joke in. I'm going to put a Star Wars joke in. And I was like, mm, come on, like, because it got really out of hand on Fallout 2. And I was like, I, like, take it easy, guys. So, but it was kind of really bumming some of the devs out. They're like, well, Fallout's fun. Like, we should be able to do silly stuff. So I thought about it, and I was like, okay, what's, what's a way that we can kind of have our cake and eat it too? And I came up with the idea of a trait called Wild Wasteland, where it's something that at the beginning of the game, the player can say, I want the silly, goofy stuff. And they turn it on, and it says, you know, your experience is going to be different. Um, it's not going to be like more or less really in the net of things, but you're going to see wacky stuff, so get ready. And if you don't like it, don't take it. Um, and it was a very low cost because it was all, the burden was entirely on the developers. So I said, if you want to put a silly thing in, you have to put in a non-silly equivalent. So if you want to put in, um, you know, if you want to put in Indiana Jones in the refrigerator there with some treasure, like, you know, as your Crystal Skull reference, you can do that, but you have to make the normal version that isn't Indiana Jones, but has equivalent loot for the player. So I said, if you want to do the extra work, you can, but you have to do the extra work. You can't just do Wild Wasteland stuff with no normal equivalent. So we got a lot of Wild Wasteland content, but just the fact that they needed to support it kind of reduced the overall nuttiness of it. Um, and the cost of failure was a really small number of bugs. Like, it was a very simple variable. Either the player has Wild Wasteland or they, doesn't, or they don't, and it disabled or enabled that content. Um, in the long run, the number of bugs it created was extremely small. So low risk, low cost. And a lot of people actually loved Wild Wasteland. So I didn't know about this. So I actually went to go get, um, I just did a Google image search for the Wild Wasteland logo. And I found probably a dozen tattoos of the logo, which is crazy. I mean, I don't know if you can see it entirely, but it's a skull with a fedora on it, um, a, a small dog with sunglasses, and an alien. People got that tattooed on their body. Um, that's pretty crazy. So like a lot of fans really thought Wild Wasteland was funny. They loved it. I was initially really resistant to it. 
but I found a compromise that really made the devs happy and a lot of players very happy as well. Ligature loathing. So I'm a big fan of typography, and one of the things I like about 19th and 17th century um, typesetting is the use of ligatures. So if you look at the background of this image, you can see that the ST and the CT have little swooshes connecting those letters. Those are ligatures. Um, and they are commonly used in old uh, print, and they've mostly disappeared in the modern era. But because our game is set in a quasi 16th century setting, I was like, I want to use a typeface that has ligatures, and they're going to be awesome. So I picked that typeface, and we used it for a really long time. Um, and we found this typeface called Espinosa Nova. It was beautiful. It supported a ton of ligatures. We turned it on, and some of the developers could not stand them. They thought it was a bug. I had people come into my office. I had people come into my office and saying, what's, what's up with the font? And I was like, I don't know what you're, like, what do you, what do you mean, what's up with it? And they're like, there's some bug between the S and the T, and the CT is like, it's all messed up. And I'm like, those are ligatures. And they're like, they're awful, I hate them. It makes it hard for me to read. And my initial response was very negative. <laughs> uh, I was like, you're being dumb. It doesn't make it harder to read. It's totally fine. You're overreacting. And um, I still kind of think that. Um, <laughs> it's not that hard to read. Um, but ultimately, what I realized is well, they really are having a strong negative reaction to it. So I thought, if they're having a strong negative reaction to it, maybe some of our players will also have a strong negative reaction to it, even though I didn't understand what, a, what it was about it. that Like, they thought the font was fine before the ligatures were turned on. So the font wasn't the problem. It was the ligatures. And so I went to programming, and I said, how much would it cost to implement an option where you could turn ligatures off? And they're like, it's like a few hours of work. I was like, okay, do it. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's just an open type feature in the font. You can just turn them off. They're optional. And so we put it in there, and then people went in, and they were like, yeah, I hate these, and they turn them off. Um, it was trivial. It was like no cost at all. I think it ruins the look of the game, but <laughs> if people want to do that, that's fine. Um, I would rather have them enjoy the experience of reading than be frustrated by the ligatures. And as soon as the game came out, we had people right away <laughs> who were saying, what's wrong with the font? Um, and then people said, oh, yeah, that's ligatures. You can turn it off in the options. And they were like, oh, great, no problem. If I hadn't put that feature in, they would have been pissed because they would have had the same reactions that our devs had. Uh, Benwith and Eldis, not a love story. So we had a quest line in our game with these two pirate captains, ben, uh, Captain Benwith and Captain Eldis. And the initial concept was that Benwith was jilted as a lover by Eldis, and he wanted revenge against her. Uh, we had some devs say, hey, there are a lot of people who have to deal with the jilted ex stalking them and like trying to kill them, so it's like a little uncomfortable. Um, and they said, like, does it ultimately like does it really does this need to be the setup of these two characters? And initially I was kind of like, well, I mean. Maybe, and then I more thought more. The more I thought about it, I was like, no, not really. Like, it wasn't really important to the quest. We just needed a motivation. We needed a motivation that meant that Benwith could betray Eldis. And there were lots of other ideas we had. The idea of him being a jilted lover was like just the first idea we came up with. No one was really attached to it. And by listening to the devs who were saying like this comes off kind of weird, um, we changed it. No one certainly thought that it was worse in the end, and the people who thought it was kind of weird to begin with felt a lot better about it. Um, the cost to do it was really trivial. It was like we changed the design doc a little bit, and then there were a dozen lines of dialogue we changed. It was really, really simple. By the way, if you look at those portraits there, it's those people. So um, another idea that we had early on on the project was uh, the concept artist who had to do all of the character portraits in the game said, hey, can I put developers in the game? And I said, sure, because he had to do 200 of them or 300 of them. So um, Alec wound up being Benwith, and Katrina wound up being Eldis. Uh, the last example I have is the stone giant. This is the huge statue that was in Ad Nua. Uh, during the Kickstarter campaign for Pillars of Eternity, our art director, Rob Nessler, had to draw level by level this mega dungeon that wound up being 15 levels. Um, this was like based on a backer challenge where the more people that liked the page or shared or something, 
uh, the more levels were added to the dungeon. And as Rob started adding more and more levels, he started drawing this like, like there was a hand coming out of the top of the dungeon, and then there was a head, this big stone head in the middle of the dungeon. And I went over to Rob and I was like, what is this? <laughs> um, uh, did someone specify this? And he was like, I don't really want to draw 15 levels with just dungeon stuff in it. So he was like, I thought it'd be neat if there was this statue that was built through it. And then the deeper we get, the more people get excited about like, well, maybe we'll get to his hand or his waist or his feet. And like, which would be really like, wow, I mean, that would have to be 15 levels, um, which it was. Um, but it was, I was like, okay, I don't really know how this ties into anything, but sure, knock yourself out. And people were actually really intrigued by it. They were like, whoa, like, what's this, what's this dude in, in the statue? Um, when we finally made the Endless Paths of Adnua, that statue was built into all the, well, not all the levels, but many of the levels, and it became a visual landmark as the player went deeper and deeper. So when they got to the head, they were like, wow, I've like really come down a long way. When they got to the hand, they realized how far they had gone down. And when they got to the feet, they realized they were at the very bottom of the dungeon. Um, and it also became the actual story for why the dungeon existed. The dungeon was created to allow the construction of the statue, which was going to house the soul of the creator's son who had died. Um, so it was this very tragic story that was developed just by this artist having this like, I don't really want to draw 15 dungeon levels. Like, <laughs> um, And then, of course, for those of you who have played the series, that statue came back as the antagonist in Pillars of Eternity Deadfire. So the player's keep was actually built above the statue. And then at the beginning of Deadfire, the dead god Aethys, uh, his soul goes into the statue and he tears himself out of the ground and then tears across the dead fire. So this all came out of just the artist having a neat idea for an illustration. And I could have said, hey, this isn't part of my spec. I don't know what this is supposed to be, but Rob had a really cool idea. It really appealed to people, and so I just let him run with it. It was a very little thing that ultimately wound up being extremely influential in the look of one of the biggest parts of the game. So going back to the big picture of what this all means as a creative director on a project, uh, be passionate about what you're doing, but be humble. Be humble from the perspective of thinking of the audience. Be humble when you realize that other people on your team have things that they can contribute to make the game stronger. Think of your audience. They're, they're the people you're making the game for. Uh, provide guidance to people. Um, they can't do things without knowing what direction they're going in, so you have to help them throughout the course of development. And ultimately, let others uh, help you accomplish your goals. You're all setting out to do something together, and you can't do it without them. So you need their help to get those things done. Thank you very much. OK, I think we have time for a few questions. So as an old school gamer who's into RPGs, I'm pretty curious about your opinion. Why are Japanese RPGs so different from American ones? Oh man, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess I would say it's a completely different culture. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. It's, uh, I am not super familiar with Japanese culture. I think it's just, for a long time, those markets were very divided. Um, I think that Western RPGs, the style of games that I kind of grew up playing and making, were largely PC-focused. Um, Japanese RPGs were more focused on the console market. Um, and ultimately, like there wasn't initially a ton of crossover between them. And I think it's just that they developed in different environments in different ways. Even if the first Final Fantasies were in some ways inspired by Ultima, which was in turn inspired by uh, Dungeons and Dragons, they diverged pretty quickly. And so as, you know, especially the Final Fantasy series started developing, they emphasized things like cinematics and character development in a way that Western RPGs didn't really at the time. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer, but I think it really just comes down to the very different cultures and the development environments were very different from the beginning, and I think that sort of developed the course for them. Oh, wow, one question, awesome. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi. Uh, how many games did you work on as a non-director before being allowed to be a director? 
Um, how many games did I work on as a non-director before allowed being, uh, so I worked on, well, so Black Isle did not have directors at all, and Obsidian did not have directors until the very end of Aliens Crucible, which was not soon enough to prevent any, for it from being canceled. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't have been given this responsibility, but I became a lead, I was a junior designer on Icewind Dale, and I was the lead designer on Icewind Dale too. Um, should that happen normally? Probably not, but um, that happened very quickly. So um, I worked on a number of games either as a senior designer or a lead designer between Icewind Dale 2 and uh, Aliens Crucible. I was the lead designer in Aliens Crucible and we didn't have a director and it became very dysfunctional and so toward the very end of the project I said, please, please make me the director so that I can help focus what we're doing because we had a lot of arguments that we just, we couldn't resolve. And I didn't want to come in and smack people around. I just wanted to come in and say like, hey, we need to move together in this direction. And there are certain things that we're going to do that people aren't going to be happy with, but we need to do them. So um, we really didn't institute directors until about, I guess that would be about five or six years into my career. Um, but no, we didn't have any directors at all. So it's a little bit, little bit weird. Um, but a lead, I was a lead after about a year, which is kind of weird. So. Um, you talked about Polynesian woodworking. How much time do you actually spend uh, looking at art and art history? A lot. Um, so um, I, I am, I'm very blessed that I have artists who are very inspired and motivated, and often they do a lot of the research themselves. Um, so for example, with, a, with the Balinese woodwork, I provided a few examples. I said, like, I'm thinking of stuff like this. And they were like, okay, we get it. And then the artist, uh, Mitch, who wound up actually doing the work, he went and he got a ton of additional reference that was all kind of, that's what, like, when it, going back to what I said, provide, provide reference and a framework to work within. I was like, something in here, something in here. And then Mitch got a bunch of additional reference that was all in there. And some of, a few were kind of on the edges. And then we sat down together with the lead artist, Kazaruga, and we went through and we were like, oh yeah, this is really working well. What do you, and some of it was like, uh, this detail might be too fine. Um, the color of this might be too light and it might kind of make the whole interface look really bright and weird. And so we talked a lot about individual elements and what was working and not working. So um, I did a lot of upfront research on the basic concepts and then the individual artists do a lot deeper uh, research on their own. Um, we also, I also worked with a really fantastic artist at Obsidian, Lindsay Laney who is extremely interested in costume design and historical, um, like not just the look and feel of them, but how they're constructed. And so whenever we were doing new outfits for cultures, she would do a ton of research and she had a huge library of uh, reference books to rely on. So I have a general idea about that stuff and I would say I'm thinking of something, again, like something around here. And then she would go and she would provide all this additional reference and that would really refine the direction that we were moving in. So I always have to do a little bit on my own, though. Um, maybe you could explain some steps of your career path, because I find it very interesting that you said that you're not a programmer, but at the same time, maybe not an illustrator, but you're a designer. So how did you get where you are now? Uh, not in a way I would recommend to anyone. Um, <laughs> so I got in the industry in uh, 1999, I initially went to school for music, for singing. Um, and then I switched and got a degree in history. And, um, whoa, whoops, sorry. Don't do that. Okay. Um, and I taught myself web design during college. So in the mid 90s, the web was kind of taking off. I taught myself web design. I taught myself Flash, Flash 3. And Yes, I'm old. Um, and I had, des thankfully I had designed a website for a tattoo parlor that used Flash. And right as I was about to graduate, I had a horrible grade point average. I had a history degree with a theater minor. I did not know what I was going to do with those things. Um, and then a job opening appeared for a web designer at Black Isle Studios. I applied for the job and I got it in part because I knew Flash, so having, it's always useful to say, have a skill that almost no one has. Um, at that time, 
they said that 62 people applied for the web position and of them three knew Flash. So if I had not done that tattoo website, I probably wouldn't have been here, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I got that job and then I worked on the Planescape Torment website. That was the first thing that I did when I got to Black Isle. And I worked very closely with Colin McComb, Chris Avalone, Guido Henkel, Tim Donnelly, Fergus, all the, all the cool Black Isle guys who were working on Torment. And one of the things that I really wanted to do because I had a very strong tabletop background was I said, I really want to make sure that you guys are happy with how I'm portraying your game. And I really want to make sure that it captures the feeling of Planescape as a setting, which is a really weird setting. And in the process of doing that, I think some of the uh, senior designers realized that I knew a ton about D&D. &D. Um, like a ton, a ton like uh, Colin McComb is one of the, was a designer at TSR. And Colin was kind of like, in some ways felt that I knew more about D&D &D than he did. Or like more about the Forgotten Realms because I was like constantly playing it. Um, and so I had an opportunity to become a junior designer on Icewind Dale. When I say I had an opportunity, I meant that I harassed Fergus for like probably four months. And an opening came, but he said, but we still need you to do web design. And I was like, all right. So um, I was not that good of a web designer, but I kept doing it. Um, in the meantime, I did uh, game design, and then I just transitioned eventually out of web into, um, into game design. And at that time, it's important to say that if there were any schools that had game design or development programs, they were like really nascent, like they were not mature at all. So many, many, many of the designers, especially at Black Isle, were people who had humanities degrees. So um, I think Colin McComb had a philosophy degree, Chris Avalon has an English degree, I have a history degree. Um, there are lots of people who had humanities, sort of critical thinking oriented degrees. There are tons of people who had uh, pen and paper either design background or playing experience. So it was very, very different, I think, from the current environment where there are many more educational programs and opportunities for people to actually have a, a structured track in, into game development. Uh, are, you as, are you as a lead designer also responsible for the game ideas on, or in concepts? Sometimes. Um, so yeah, the question is if I'm responsible for the, the concepts of the games themselves. It depends on the game. Um, with Fallout New Vegas, I think the general idea is Obsidian could make a Fallout game. <laughs> um, and so like our, our CEO, Fergus, talked to Bethesda and said, how about it? And then uh, Chris Avalon had the idea of it being set near Vegas. And the initial idea was that your character was shot in the head and left in a shallow grave. And that was pretty much the idea. That was the idea of what Fallout New Vegas was. And then we signed the contract, and then I took over as director, and I was like, and then all the other stuff I came up with. So everything else about, well, I shouldn't say that. All the other high-level stuff I came up with. So I said, it, it is, um, so it starts with you being shot in the head and dropped in a grave, and I said it has to end with you deciding the fate of the Mojave based on the Battle of Hoover Dam. Um, I also came up with the ideas of what factions would be there, but our creative lead, John Gonzalez, designed Benny, Mr. House, um, all the families that were on the strip, um, and he wrote all those. So it was a collaborative effort between myself and John Gonzalez and then the other designers on the team. There are other projects where I just come up with a whole thing from scratch. That's not that common, um, in part because a lot of our studio's work is work for hire. So we go to a publisher, like Aliens was, so we were already working on Alpha Protocol, um, someone had an idea for a spy RPG, so we started working on Alpha Protocol with Sega, and that was something that someone just came up with. And then at some point, Sega got the Aliens license, and they were like, hey, who wants to make an Aliens game? And they said, do you guys want to make an Aliens RPG? And we said, sure. Um, but the initial idea of an Aliens RPG came from Sega. So sometimes it's from the publisher, sometimes it's on your side, but it's like a sketch that then gets fleshed out later. Pillars of Eternity was not my idea alone, but I conceived of the world and designed all the basic principles of it and things like that. So it depends a lot. Okay, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for coming here and for this fantastic talk. I think, um, again, it was announced on Thursday and it's very full. Thank you also for coming, everyone. So let's give Josh a big round of applause for coming here and being part of um, what we're doing here at Teokratz.